Hello, fellow metalheads and others. Welcome to the podcast Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. I suppose it was inevitable that we would get to Satan sooner or later, given how often he appears in our sources. You know, there's a Godwin's Law, which is a general principle formulated by, I think it was a lawyer uh, in the 90s, about online message boards, which was that the longer any particular discussion went on, um, like on an internet message board, the likelihood that it would, that someone would soon make a Hitler comparison (laughs) or mention Hitler or the Nazis would rise to 100%. And this is true in Byzantine theological texts, where, where the likelihood that someone will start mentioning Satan, you know, if a debate has gone on for long enough, it, it's virtually 100%. I have found only scant traces of pro-Satan attitudes um, in these texts, and they, of course, are always reporting on their satanic panic kind of texts that report on you know secret rituals that these obscure evil cults are doing. But they're there. like They believe that there were such people who worshipped Satan, And it's surprising how little the rhetoric has changed between those kinds of medieval panics and the the 1980s panics about satanic panics, you know, about music and Dungeons and Dragons and things like this that that I remember from the 80s. So today we're going to be talking about Roman Byzantium and Roman and later Roman emperors in heavy metal music. And my guest is Jeremy Swist. Uh, who is um, in classics at Brandeis University. Uh, And this is one of the two areas that he researches. And I am reading some articles uh, by him here and there about, you know, Rome and Byzantium in heavy metal. And over time, it kind of accumulated to a critical mass where I thought, okay, this is a real thing, and we should do an episode on it. Now, he also has another side, which is uh, working on, I think he's preparing a manuscript on the Emperor Julian, and I very much look forward to reading that when it's ready. We could possibly do another episode on that. Uh, but he's here uh, today in his capacity as uh, someone who researches and knows uh, the genre of heavy metal music. And he'll be able to explain it uh, much better than I, uh, though um, I was briefly in the scene in the 80s, um, after which I turned sharply into... Um, opera um, and by extension classical music and have been there ever since, a transition that in retrospect now seems very natural, uh, though it might not seem so to most people at first sight. Anyway, I will allow Jeremy to explain heavy metal. Uh, He knows much more about it than I do. And honestly, most of the bands that he will be mentioning and has written about, I'm not familiar with. My knowledge ends pretty much around 1990. Uh, with a few bands uh, after that that um, I, I continue to follow uh, because I like their stuff. So just some very general reflections about what might have led um, artists in heavy metal music to um, seek out historical topics such as Roman and Byzantine emperors. So apart from its harmonious and soothing musical style, heavy metal was marked more by a kind of attitude, and that was an attitude of... A, you know, adolescent rebellion and um, a sort of deep discomfort with the hypocrisies of you know respectable society, the kind of post-war bourgeoisie, the kind of pseudo-religious moralizing and so forth. Or is it religious pseudo-moralizing? So if in the 1980s, <laughs> remember this is the era of like Reagan and the possibility of nuclear war and AIDS. If you thought that all of these adults were really hypocrites and that the entire establishment of respectable opinion, and that includes, for example, literature, like with a capital L, that was all about the boring and predictable pathologies of bourgeois middle-class life, right? Uh, So all of the respectable genres were just BS. And the the human experience offered alternatives that you could find in history or fantasy or science fiction that were way more fun to think about. (laughs) Well, heavy metal was one of the places to go. And even conventional rock and roll was not 
really good enough because sex and drugs was still part of the here and now. In fact, they were part of the whole tangle that made up the mess that was the middle class lifestyle. So if you really wanted to open a space where you could just fantasize about real alternatives, this was one of them. By the way, opera is another. Now, this, of course, tended toward extremes, Satanism being one of those extremes. I don't think that, at least in the 80s, it was ever meant in anything other than a tongue-in-cheek fashion. I, that, that is how I at least took all of it. It was all an act, a fun act but it was an act. Now, after the 90s, I understand that things got a little angrier, but um, that's a later experience. So heavy metal always tends to gravitate toward these extremes, extremes of fantasy, um, though, as you will hear, they can also be extremes of nationalism, fascism, but also the opposites, uh, anarchism and take down the whole system and so forth. It reminds me a lot of the 1840s environment of Wagner and Bakunin, by the way. It makes for great revolutionary art and opera, not necessarily politics. Anyway, this is part of the reason why metal music gravitates towards history, sort of extraordinary figures in history who seem to be pushing the boundaries of human existence in various ways, or toward fantasy or horror, like many genres of metal are basically B or C level horror, you know, in musical form. And so I thought it was fascinating to read what they made of the, the period that we study and how it can fit into those kinds of concerns. And, and, and sure enough, Jeremy will lay it out for you. There's, there's a lot of all sides of the political spectrum going on here with some fascinating permutations. For example, so many bands love Nero but condemn Constantine, it seems, on Enlightenment grounds. This is fascinating, a heavy metal band standing its ground on the Enlightenment values and critiquing Constantine the Great. All right, I'll stop here. Um, Shout-outs to Brian Swain, Dallas DeForest, and Alex Sarandis. They will know why if they're listening to these podcasts. Also, thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. And here is my conversation with Jeremy. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Anthony. Uh, welcome. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I uh, thought you we'll, were going to like do We'll the... start again. Okay, sorry. I thought you were going to be like, I didn't expect you to talk to me immediately. <laughs> it's like, I thought you were oh, going to no. like, oh, right, do right. kind of that. You're going to do that later. Like, my bad. Uh, Yes, introductory material. Introductions I record later. Right, right. I yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I just caught me off guard. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. So let's do this again. Uh, let me. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. It's good to finally meet you. Great to finally meet you too, Anthony. Thanks for having me on. I think we were in the same panel at New Orleans on like the future of the book review as a genre, right? You were sitting on the other side of anyway. I didn't know it was you at the time, but uh, yeah, well, I knew it was you. But uh, a mutual Facebook friend of ours uh, messaged me um, later that day, um, saying that uh, you were a metalhead (laughs) and that I should meet you. Uh, And so uh, that then I sent you an email. But by then, you know, the conference had ended, and so we had to correspond uh, right remotely well, you would yes you wouldn't know that from the state of my hair right now but <laughs> you've got the cred but but so i saw this um this old geezer at a grocery store once in ohio and he had this t-shirt that said sure i'm old but i got to see all the cool bands so yeah so back in the 80s i did see some of the cool bands um my my involvement with the whole scene kind of ended after 1990. We, can't, we, we, we talk about that later. But um, l- let me just ask you first to orient, you know, any cultural snobs that we have in the audience here about what we're talking about, because I'm pretty sure that most of them know what heavy metal is. But I do have colleagues who, for real, like if I ask them, like, do you know who Darth Vader is? 
Uh, by the way, these are Europeans. Mm -hmm. And they they can vaguely describe the figure, but have no idea the narrative, what it means, or like they will not watch American popular culture films, right? Like totally out of it. Um, so can you just tell us briefly what heavy metal music is and what are its main attributes and styles and so forth? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, unlike Darth Vader, where you can just go and watch Star Wars and have a pretty good idea of the character, um, when you ask somebody to define heavy metal, um, I like to think of it as asking, say, someone who knows ancient Greek uh, to define the word logos, right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's something where if you're immersed in the language and the literature and you encounter that word, enough you intuit kind of all of its different meanings and valences such that you are not no longer able to just give a straightforward definition or translation you have to sort of kind of approach it from different angles um similar word like in latin auctoritas for the latinists out there right so i think of heavy metal in that way where yes at the core it's a style of music but that music also gives rise to uh various aesthetics uh, and kind of a, a, a subculture uh, around it that uh, I think the heavy metal or for short metal label applies to. But I'll focus on the music uh, for now. So heavy metal music uh, began in the early 70s with bands like Black Sabbath. And what they were doing was uh, doing a progression from kind of blues and rock and roll and psychedelic rock and et cetera. And they kind of put it together and they were highly inspired by horror mu movies, uh, hence the name of the band. And they wanted to create something that was darker, something that played upon extreme emotions uh, of fear and terror uh, and depression kind of topics that were not really explored in the 1960s by a lot of bands that tended to focus on, you know, love and peace and all of that. Um, they really wanted to kind of confront these more negative aspects of the human condition uh, more directly and reflect that in their music. And that's what Black Sabbath did. And that's what a lot of other bands after them did. Uh, and that's still one of the core kind of lyrical themes of heavy metal. Um, though with these kind of expressions of extremes and extreme emotions in metal, we also see metal as sort of an outlets for lots of different sort of impulses and frustrations and also such that this music provides kind of a, a an outlet or a refuge for people who feel socially alienated and disempowered for instance. And so there's a lot of heavy metal music out there, especially dealing with the ancient world where these are sort of fantasies of empowerment or escape to mm. somewhere, uh, you know, that isn't the present where you feel, you know, like you are, <laughs> you have, uh, you have nothing, uh, you can't do anything about what's going on. So that's sort of kind of the social need that it fills in terms of the music itself. Um, you know, you've have your standard, uh, drums, guitar, bass, and vocals, which can be used for a number of styles of music, but heavy metal specifically, um, you know, relies on heavily distorted guitars, creating, um, you know, high volume walls of sound, uh, and also speed, but also sort of, uh, they can also be very slow. Um, there tends to be a high level of technicality in a lot of, in a lot of genres. Uh, the creation of atmosphere, the creation of sort of sounds that are kind of take you out of the mundane. Um, and some of it can be quite aggressive. Some of it can be quite atmospheric. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so again, metal itself, even if you're trying to define it musically, and I'm not a musicologist, so I probably could have done this better. Um, it is still a very highly diverse genre that um, depending on the subgenres, you know, can fulfill various um, needs and appeal to people who are interested in other kinds of music. Um, so instance, for instance, like if you're into kind of atmospheric black metal, uh, you know, you might also be into kind of ambient music, 
right? Or what you might call dungeon synth, which is kind of keyboard synthesized music that kind of creates that kind of medieval atmosphere. Mm. Okay? So um, those are some examples. That's a good description. Now that you're mentioning it, I, I honestly cannot remember why exactly I was drawn to it as a teenager. Uh, and it was for a number of years. Then I very quickly made the leap to classical music, especially like romantic stuff in the 19th century and kind of stayed there. Um, by the way, so, so I remember the the you know famous bands from the 1980s like Iron Maiden and Metallica and these kinds of things that that was your sort of bread and butter heavy metal kind of music and they were fun like it's pretty clear to me that I was drawn to because what they were doing was fun and it, they 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 seemed to be having fun doing it and in so far as there was like you know kind of satanist adjacent stuff going on it was I took it all as tongue in cheek like all of it and anyway um so what's the state of the genre today? Uh, I, I know that it's kind of exploded in diversification. So it's like all over the place right now, right? Like, is it still around? Is it a thriving scene? Um, presumably all the glam hair bands have gone away. Um, but yeah, so what is, what is the state of the field right now? Um, I think in the past decade, heavy metal has experienced a renaissance oh, right. um, it never died you know since the early 90s um but i think there's more people who listen to metal and to and who play heavy, heavy metal in all parts of the world of uh most countries classes colors and creeds who are interested in this music to varying degrees um and who are experimenting in it uh blending it with other styles of music or reviving styles of heavy metal that were around in the 70s and 80s. I think that's particularly um, popular now. And that's sort of what I like personally. But, you know, for the past, you know, several decades that, you know, since metal's inception, um, it never went away. It might have gone underground, mm. um, but it is certainly today, I think, far more accepted uh, in society, um, at least in perhaps, uh, you know, some parts of the world more than others, uh, such that, you know, it's no longer the stereotype of um, the kind of uneducated high school dropout white male kind of edgy teenager, right? Uh, you know, there's people of all ages and genders uh, and and other various demographics who are uh, to whom this music appeals, who are also uh, contributing to the evolution of these of, of this style of music and see themselves even represented uh, in it um, and have more to add, I think. Right. Um, and I think that's wonderful. Um, as for, as you mentioned, some of the kind of the religious and even uh, satanic aspects of it, you know, so... You know, Black Sabbath, of course, was, you know, brought a lot of that religious and satanic imagery into the into kind of into the the kind of the heavy metal discourse as sort of ways of, you know, channeling themes of darkness and horror uh, and sin. And then by the 80s, you know, we see that kind of language taken up uh, and kind of viewed po more positively as sort of symbolic expressions of liberation from society's moral constraints you know you said what appeals to you about heavy metal or at least back then was that it, these people were having fun and you know i think heavy metal you know is akin to like a dionysian ritual from antiquity where this is an outlet for people to kind of break out of their kind of social constraints hmm. and to kind of almost just be somebody else right yes, um to kind of you know, ecstasis, right? Um, oh, yes. You know, an experience kind of uh, extreme emotions, passions, uh, and, you know, not care about what anybody thinks about you, right? You know, people who go to a metal gig, they often dress up, right, in a different style of clothes uh, than they might wear, wear in their working, well, wear at work. Um, and they just, and they're also surrounded by people who look like that. So it provides that kind of sense of, a, of, of almost of a congregation. That is a um, very interesting comparison. And, and yeah. by the way, some of our audience, if they've never been to a metal concert, they, you know, uh, you know, 
hold that thought until you've been to one because what you're mm. saying is exactly right it's it's really quite an experience yeah and i think today more than ever um back to what i was recently saying is you know a metal gig now i think is a much more welcoming and inclusive space um most for most subgenres at least uh than it used to be before where it was highly kind of white male uh, heteronormative dominated and uh, you know people like women and people of color you know felt kind of alienated and I and I think there's you know met, as metal has become more diverse in terms of mm. its fan base and also its its representation with among musicians um, you know and I think just metalheads maturing and becoming more self-aware about some of the kind of the problematic things that the problematic histories uh, of this subculture which is you know something you see in other kind of musical and even academic cultures, right? So the satanic stuff, to go back to that, largely still, you know, if you see use satanic or anti-Christian imagery in metal, it's usually more an aesthetic and a symbolic way to kind of identify yourself as being part of kind of the metal aesthetic, the metal culture, and it's not necessarily uh, a reflection of your ideological or religious convictions. Um, yes, some bands, uh, you know, who dabble in Satanism are committed Satanists, and they take this very seriously. But the majority of them are kind of using this as sort of a symbol of transgression. Mm -hmm. And I think transgression is one of the core themes of heavy metal, which is, again, rebelling against the status quo and using imagery that is intended to be iconoclastic, to shock, right? I think the influence of shock rock is uh, very much apparent. Uh, and, you know, I think it's almost, I think of it like, almost like it's like uh, Gorgonea, you know, images of a Gorgon or of gargoyles on a cathedral, right? Mm. Is we use these images, we dress this way because it's apotropaic. It's a way of identifying with the culture, but it's also a way to kind of filter out people who um, we don't identify with and sort of keep them away from us, right? Um, I'm a nice person, but if you're, you know, if you take issue with, you know, the the band shirt I'm wearing, then I wouldn't really want to talk to you anyway. Yeah, I, I like that you're using all these classical terms to explain the whole scene, because you're you're, you're exactly right. Um, you know, from the from the Dionysiac to the Apotropaic, um, and as for the the to Renaissance that you mentioned earlier, I, I suspect that there might also be a kind of generational recycling here. In other words, the the people who were teenagers back in the '80s, such as myself, are now like have disposable income. And are kind of, you know, n nostalgic for their teenage years and, you know, are like, hey, whatever happened to those bands? And you realize, oh, wait, no, they're still around. Mm -hmm. And you and you go to the concert. And, and so it's our generation. And and we're all now like professors of classics, <laughs> you know, like, you know, not exactly join the resistance, as it were. But um, this, you know, it certainly fuels to its respectability, its respectability, because here mm -hmm. we are doing a podcast about it. Um so so let's talk about politics and especially history and Roman and Byzantine history, which, uh, you know, we're, we're going to uh, link these two things up here. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've written a lot about um, metals fascination with Roman emperors. So let's just start there and work our way you know, later into history. So which emperors are they most fascinated with and why? <laughs> OK, that's a, a great question to start with, because I think with Roman emperors and specific Roman emperors, um, we see a figure that projects the core kind of appeals and themes of heavy metal, which is transgression, but also power, masculinity, and escapism, and also sort of kind of liberation of one's passions and kind of also fantasies of control. Right. Again, a lot of this music is served to empower people um, who otherwise feel powerless. You know, it's almost like playing you're playing a video game, you know, where you're, you know, some sort of warrior. Right. Um, who is, you know, able to succeed in some in some in some challenge. Right. So Roman emperors do often fit that category because. If you're a Roman emperor, you have complete, at least in, you know, at least from this 
point of view, you have mm. complete power to do whatever you want. Uh, you can satisfy all of your carnal delights or violent impulses with impunity, I suppose, to an extent. Um, and you become sort of this infamous figure who nevertheless, um, because they kind of did some notorious act, are remembered for it, right? Um, so, for instance, um, you know, you think about the Herostratus, the guy who burned down the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. And the mm -hmm. only reason he did that is to go down in history as doing this right. drastic act, right? right. Um, and there actually is a one or two metal songs about Herostratus, uh, very obscure, but uh, now look at, think of Roman emperors who are known for those types of things, Caligula and Nero. Um, statistically, are by and large the most popular Roman emperors in heavy metal, which is interesting uh, because they're not warriors. Mm -hmm. um, you do have a lot of songs about Julius Caesar and some other emperors who you know were good for leading armies and being that sort of warrior. Uh, but these two were not really known for that, but they made up for it by being these figures who went to extremes of extravagance uh, and sexual carnal depravity uh, and engaged in bloodlust and murder, right? Um, metal is nothing but something that it loves to be extravagant over the top. Moderation, right, is not, or temperance is antithetical the heavy metal it's all about extremes um and so you know Cal caligula um certainly but nero even more so partly because in addition to what i mentioned he also is known uh traditionally as the original persecutor of christians right and even in the ancient and the hagiographical literature right um he is seen as the uh, arch persecutor and a lot of things are attributed to him uh, that maybe he didn't necessarily do. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see that in metal songs about him where um, they see him, you know, executing Christians in the Colosseum, even though the Colosseum didn't exist yet, right? Because right. his golden palace was in the way. It, right. Right. Yes. Uh, and, and other things like that. And he was a singer. Mm. Right. So it's like cultural transgression by like a, a musician. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, in fact, one of the first metal songs about Nero is by this uh, band from Switzerland called Messiah. Uh, and they put out this song um, about Nero in the late 80s. They're a thrash metal band. Right. Uh, and so as a thrash metal band, they are very interested in figures that are um you know, commit violence um, kind of for its own sake, not necessarily because they admire them, but because this is sort of a channel of aggression, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems that they are largely inspired not just by kind of what the ancient and historical sources say about Nero, but also, and this is important, what Hollywood has presented him as. And it seems right. that they were highly influenced by watching Quo Vadis, Right. Mm -hmm. And that representation of Nero. And they saw Nero as sort of a proto heavy metal musician. Right. Because he, you know, him playing his lyre and playing it with very not playing it very well was sort of part of the thrash metal aesthetic where they're yes. not so much interested in melody as in some sort of discordant and dissonant sort of sound. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that, and also kind of Quo Vadis is Nero, kind of him burning down Rome is part of his sort of artistic... What a set. Uh, exactly, right. He yeah. kind of represents sort of himself as a... As a infernal. Work, right, a totalizing work of art. Yeah, yeah, and uh, infernal. Like, it's like the Lord of the, you know, hell. And, yeah. you know, he's like the original 666, Mark of the Beast. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, and this is another thing I've I've... I've looked at a lot is how Roman emperors like Nero and others, especially that persecute Christians uh, are syncretized or assimilated with uh, the devil himself. They become sort of uh, viceroys of, uh, mm. of Satan on earth and carrying out, you know, his, his, his work is sort of a, you know, an anti 
you know, whoever does that, an antichrist, right? Right, yeah. Right. There you go. <laughs> so in those articles, you make this excellent point about the paradox of transgression, right? <laughs> which, which is kind of what you're leading to here, which is that metal bands see themselves as a kind of minority that's kind of socially frowned upon. And even when they're not socially frowned upon, they want to be socially frowned upon. And they see like Christianity as some kind of like dominant order that's trying to oppress them. Um, you know, it was, with some reason in the 80s, there were all these moral panics and, you know, mm -hmm. so forth. Um, and yet they identify with these establishment figures like the Roman emperors, right, who are not exactly persecuted minorities. In fact, the persecuted minorities at that time were the Christians, right? So mm -hmm. you talk, can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that kind of paradox? Like how do metal bands work themselves into this weird thing of supporting the man? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the moral panics of the eighties and nineties, the satanic panics, you know, uh, we can see as similar to perhaps some of the language of moral panic that the opponents of early Christianity, uh, kind of were, Mm. Or, or airing, you know, these mm -hmm. are countercultural social deviants who are disloyal to the empire. Uh, they are engaging in all sorts of sexual debauchery, right, behind closed doors, right. Um, and so, and these are these people are a problem, right. And we saw the same thing in the '80s with, you know, um, Tipper Gore and that whole kind of moral crusade, right, mm -hmm. with uh, with the metalheads uh, and also other genres of music like uh, like rap music that were eventually they put the parental guidance label on, you know, and all that. So, so there's certainly that that certainly feeds into this idea of of the paradox uh, where you know the Christians are this subculture counterculture. That is in many ways, whether it intended it that way or not, perceived as these these social deviants um, who are corrupting the youth, right? Um, so, but on the other hand, um, historically, you know, metal, you know, began in the UK and quickly spread to the rest of Europe and to North America, Australia, New Zealand, and so. Now it's all over the world. However, you know, most of the parts of the world where metal has been has traditionally embedded are majority Christian countries, right? And so Christianity came to be viewed as representative of the social status quo, right? Mm -hmm. Any sort of, you know, systems of moral and political uh, and even economic conformity and control they would associate with Christianity. And so Christianity became sort of the scapegoat and sort of, again, kind of went into this whole symbolic act of, well, if you're writing a song about Satan, you know, then uh, you are sort of demonstrating that one, you belong to this culture and two, that you are rebelling against, um, you know, these systems, right? And kind of asserting your independence and individuality and whatnot um, and your freedom right? Your freedom of thought, uh, especially. So by identifying Christianity as something that is antithetical to freedom of thought um, and, uh, and you know, other things that you would see as good, um, then the historical enemies of Christianity are then seen as um, your allies, right? Um, and so that is part of why, you know, the persecutions of Christianity um, by Roman emperors, however, uh, exaggerated um, the perception of how much persecuting they did is, um, is kind of seen as uh, something at least charismatic and interesting because you know, thinking of a time when your so-called oppressors are were the were the oppressed, right? Uh, almost feels like just desserts, right? right? Um, and the other thing is, there's retrospect. Um, when you're writing a song about early that features early Christianity, um, so you know, uh, bands like Creator uh, with uh, their song "Blind Faith," that was one of the first ones in the '80s. Uh, they are writing in the retrospect, knowing that eventually Christianity will triumph, mm 
right? They know eventually these the persecuted will become as they see the persecutors. And so they feel a bit, they feel like they have a bit more of a moral kind of um, license uh, to to kind of indulge in these narratives. It's like killing baby Hitler. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's 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 uh, that that's that's somewhat analogous. So, for instance, um, you know, there's some there's a song uh, by a band from Singapore called Impiety, and it is called uh, the Iron Fist of Decius. And it's about the Emperor Decius. And mm-hmm. it's actually the band is essentially doing an exhortation to Decius, you know, saying, you got to stop these people before they take over, right? Before mm-hmm. they, uh, you know, before they tear down everything you stand for, right? Um, and this leads into, you know, songs about Constantine, okay, where they blame Constantine for essentially betraying you know, everything he stood for as a Roman emperor and the kind of the pagan ancient traditions and heritage that he belongs to and rejecting all that in favor of this new system of belief and values uh, that a lot of these bands see as not coming from Europe, right? Yeah. Uh, They see it as sort of a foreign influence that is a threat to kind of their indigenous uh kind of european pagan traditions right so let's talk about that um so you mm-hmm. you've written separately about constantine and you know your metal's approach to constantine which is again also kind of paradoxical in a sense constantine mm-hmm. was a military badass he did kill more of his family members than any other emperor like if you're you know what's what's not to like right mm-hmm. uh but you you show that um, generally, the approach is negative, um, and that because yes, he did you know empower the enemy, as it were. Um, so there is also a neo pagan dimension to all of this aspect. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you were hinting at it there at the end. Yes, yes. So one of the uh, in lots of places, um, especially in. Uh, European countries, but also, you know, South America, North America, elsewhere in the world. Um, Metal is, because it is seen as fundamentally kind of anti-status quo, uh, it often brings in nostalgia for a time and place when, before the forces of that status quo took over. In other words, a way of rebelling and uh, expressing your antipathy to kind of concurrent systems of belief, control, conformity is to uh, kind of romanticize as an alternative something that existed before that, right? And so for a lot of bands, uh, that is why they have, um, a lot of them have a an interest in narratives of pre-modernity, right? Uh, A time before kind of what has become the systems that are now familiar now did not exist. And they kind of, a lot of these bands kind of see themselves as wanting to be, exist in that world where they feel empowered and they are able to kind of connect themselves to some sort of identity uh, and heritage, right? So that is why, especially one thing that developed in the uh, since the early 1990s is uh, folk metal, for instance, and metal that is um, gone from sort of conventional expressions of rebellion with Satan and, uh, you know, and kind of the glam, you know, heavy drinking, drug use, wine, women and wonderful things. and looking at kind of narratives of, say, Norse mythology, Greek mythology, um, as well as kind of the practices, uh, you know, kind of neo-pagan practices, right, as something where they can find kind of a new identity and they can kind of revive it in order to kind of live uh, in this sort of pre-modern world that, you know, they, they are romanticizing. Um, so, for instance, in Greece, you know, we have a band like Northwind, which was one of the first 
heavy metal bands to sing about Greek mythology in the late 80s. There was also a band called Sarissa, right, uh, named after the Macedonian uh, uh, weapon, right? Uh, and then now these days, these days, you know, you have lots of bands that still do that in Greece and plenty of other parts of the world. But you also have bands in Greece and you have bands, analogous bands in other parts of Europe and North America that are committed pagans. Um, so you have a band like Kawir in Greece who are uh, devout uh, Hellenists, okay, worshipping the, the ancient Greek gods. And they bring that spirituality into their music um, very much a lot of their uh, music are, you know, hymns to the gods that are actually modeled on ancient hymns to the gods, um, such as the Homeric hymns. And in fact, uh, um, Christoloulos uh, Apergis um, is a scholar in Greece who wrote a, an excellent article on, on, on just that. Um, so, I have, so, I have, so a colleague of mine once gave me this little book, which is called All Known Metal Bands. <laughs> and it's just a list it's just you know a silver font on a black background and it just has thousands and thousands of band names and i was just looking up sarissa and, and indeed it is in here yep um yeah. but it, it's kind of poetic to read all of these names just one after another mm -hmm. for some reason there are four bands called crook i don't know what that means anyway um yeah, and, and uh there's another article uh you know which is actually just about like mythological uh metal band names because just even like a mythological name yes. right even if it has nothing to do with the themes of the band is still something that sort of symbolizes we are escaping from modernity to this sort of fantasy world and of course fantasy literature tolkien and all of that are also very popular in metal for the same reasons That's um amazing. so you have that book with all the band names uh you know, a lot of my research and a lot of my research of other uh, folks who study heavy metal academically largely benefit from the online uh, open source database, uh, the Metal Archives, uh, also known as the Encyclopedia Metallum. Um, and there you can, you know, they have an advanced search function. You can type in any sort of search term like Byzantium, Constantinople, and it'll bring up, uh, you know, all of the songs that have those terms in the lyrics. And this of course is, oh, you know, how I was able to- This is your TLG. Right, so this is, and this is, so this is something that, you know, um, anyone can can go to, to metal-archives.com and, and do their own exploration. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll find some, you'll find something that appeals to you. Yeah, I don't remember the neo-pagan scene being very prominent at all in the 80s, but I can see how you could get to it because the whole the whole satanic imagery was basically a kind of inversion of, you know, Christian fears and those Christian fears were basically just a distortion of ancient paganism. Mm -hmm. Um and and so I can see how you you know, just as you said with um Hollywood, that was also fascinating that you you they're just getting a lot of their imagery and associations from Hollywood movies ditto from like horror movies about mm -hmm. christian fears about satan mm -hmm. and eventually you know if you start following the trail of footnotes you'll get to actual classical learning and you start yeah. doing it properly yeah there is another greek band uh, a black metal band called necromantia one of the original black metal bands from greece right. and they have one of their most famous songs is called ancient pride and uh one and kind of the the key lyric in that song is, and it's the song is nominally addressing kind of Christians and it's saying, our gods became your Satan. So wow. Satan became our God. Wow. Right. Okay. And so, and of course, imagery of pan, uh, for instance, you know, anything that kind of, as you said, kind of the Christian sort of appropriation of, of pagan imagery to, uh, to represent, you know, satanic imagery, of course, is is quite popular um, in metal too. Like, for instance, um, you know, the first edited volume on heavy metal and antiquity that was put out by Osman Umerhan and Christopher Flesher uh, actually has a a vase painting, a black figure vase painting depicting Pan on the cover, which I think is um, right. was quite uh, appropriate that that Bloomsbury did there. So wait, were they singing that in English? 
So, so English is like the universal standard for even for metal bands. Mm -hmm. So heavy metal has gotten this right so far, but Byzantine scholarship still. Can... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, metal uh, English is the lingua franca of metal. Um, you know, nice. There's plenty of bands that you know even since the '80s would sing in their native language. So, for instance, one of the mo one of the best heavy metal bands out of France in the '80s was Sortilège, and they. Main, for the most part, maintain singing French, but for the most part, um, you know, they use English in order to kind of transcend their own local context, break away from sure. the mundane and be able to kind of form this, you know, international universalist brotherhood of metal, right? right. Um, though I think as time goes on, more and more bands are, especially in the age of the internet, uh, are finding that, you know, singing in their native languages, um, you know, is also can also be appealing um certainly for their local scenes um, right, right. But also we even have bands that are singing in ancient languages or reconstructed ancient languages so we have bands singing in old norse in latin uh and uh in in gaulish even right there's a band from switzerland called eluveti that do that it's quite Very it's nice. quite cool and there's scholarship on that of course <laughs> so i was also fascinated by getting back to constantine and byzantium yep. um that some metal bands take this very kind of enlightenment stance toward mm -hmm. Constantine, like they're champions of reason and enlightenment. And Constantine comes along and empowers this church that creates, I don't know, the, the dark ages, you know, this kind of mm -hmm. very, you know, by now kind of antiquated historical view. But I, I just found it fascinating that metal bands would paradoxically again, come down on the side of like <laughs> conventional enlightenment values. Um, so let's move forward in Byzantium a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So, um, have you found, so let's start with a context in which Byzantium appears, uh, in a good light in, in metal music. So where does that come from? Well, so, you know, Byzantine history is, uh, you know, over a thousand years. And so, um, you know, metals approach to Byzantium is not at all uniform, just as, um, Byzantine history is so variegated, um, depending on what perspectives you approach it from. And, um, also, the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, among kind of the very prolific reception of pre-modern history and mythology by heavy metal worldwide, the reception of Byzantium and related topics is relatively scarce. So, you know, most metal bands that are interested in that part of the world, the Mediterranean, you know, are mainly singing about Greek mythology or Greek history, especially the Spartans, or they're singing about the Romans, the Roman Empire or Republic, um, or they're singing about, you know, Western medieval Christendom, especially the Crusades um, and other, mm, other topics. Crusades. And of course, more popular than any of that is there is uh, the reception of the Vikings, right? And Norse mythology. Of course. Right? So based on what I just listed there, you can see how there are some ways to enter into the Byzantine sphere through that. So for instance, um, you know, the interest in Vikings and Norse themes leads to bands becoming interested in the Varangians, the Kievan Rus, and, you know, mm -hmm. that part of, um, of Nordic history. Uh, and so there's lots of uh, songs about the Varangian Guard and the encounters of the Vikings, quote unquote, uh, with the Byzantines. Uh, so, for instance, uh, King Harald Hardrada is often a popular figure because he had all of those adventures, partly as by serving on in the Varangian Guard, right? Um, so, for instance, one of my one of my good friends, uh, you know, Jeff Black has a band from Vancouver called Gatekeeper, and they just put out an album literally yesterday. Uh, and it has a band, it has a song called The Exiled King. Uh, and it's about Harold Hardrada. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, you see the lyric where he says, well, I, you know, we're driving to to Miklagard, right? Mm -hmm. Their their term, the great fortress of, for Constantinople. And we're going to get, you know, uh, wine and riches and plunder, right? And it's not quite clear whether they're going there to sack the city itself or they're kind <laughs> of using that as an opportunity to enrich themselves, right? Sort of in conventional ways that Vikings would do according to, you know, lots of popular perceptions of Vikings here. Um, but in terms of, you know, positive representations of the Byzantines, those are, 
uh, probably in the minority because you would expect a lot of Greek bands to be interested, but they're really not. There's only a handful. And I think I speculate this has partly to do with the Greek education system. And you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, where, you know, since the independence in the 19th century, the, the Greek education system is largely focusing on kind of their current culture as a directly directly in continuity with classical Greece, classical Athens, whereas the yeah. period of, you know, the, the Byzantine Empire is more, this is a Roman occupation, and this was sort of, uh, there's a break in continuity. Yeah, um, it's, it's either that, or insofar as it's treated as a integral part of Hellenic history, it's associated with the church very closely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. So the church today, the Church of Greece has the the, the two headed eagle on the flag, which was not like an actual Byzantine flag, but it is associated in the popular imagination with that. Yeah. And there are metal songs that incorporate the double headed eagle imagery. Yeah. Um, you know, for instance, there's a song uh, by a band uh, called uh, Folkoldia, uh, which are largely based in Greece, uh, that they had a song called Cataphract Legion, which is about Belisarius's uh, reconquest of Italy. Yeah. And it says that the double headed eagle is on all our banners and everything. And, uh, you know, though this wasn't used until the late Paleologan period, right? Uh, and not even as a military standard. Um, so there is that sort there's a sort of anachronisms in order to kind of signal this is distinctly Byzantine or this is distinctly even Greek, you know, yeah. versus what was a much more complex situation, especially in the in the sixth century when you still had the empire kind of yeah. having some of the Latin Chris and the, the yeah, Latin yeah, yeah. part in there. Yeah, I mean Belisarius has gotten a lot of interest, uh, as mm -hmm. you document. Um actually there's a an, a former guest on the podcast who shall remain nameless, who was once part of a band and they 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 put out, I think, two albums under the name Kachana, and there's one very, very good song about Belisarius mm -hmm. there. Um, I, I still can't quite decipher all of the lyrics. Right. <laughs> I've been unable to find it online. Um, and a few years ago, I came across a Finnish band um, that was described to me as battle metal. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and listening to it, it totally is that. It totally mm -hmm. sounds like battle metal. And they have this one album about I some Varangians or something who go to Constantinople, and it ends with like this fifteen-minute epic song about Miklagard, which is not bad actually. It's pretty good. Yeah, and uh, so you're talking about the Finnish band Teresis. That's right. Um, yes, and yes. they are they are a band that, unlike a lot of metal bands that kind of dabble in this, in mythology or history, they really did their homework. Mm -hmm. uh, on trying to kind of represent that era of history faithfully. And in fact, uh, you know, one of our colleagues, the Byzantinist uh, Antia Bosselman uh, who's at, uh, I think she's at Gießen currently, um, she put out uh, some scholarship on those albums um, and, uh, you know, to, to discussing uh, how, especially they came to Constantinople and viewed the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople from kind of an outsider's perspective. Right. And mm -hmm. just kind of see Constantinople itself, especially as this sort of exotic kind of city full of riches and pleasures. Right. But also opportunity and power, um, which is something that, you know, for a metal band and for and for kind of who identify as Vikings, let's say, you know, this is something that that has that has a magnetism. Um, and I think that's another common thing in the representations of Byzantium in metal, which is largely by bands that don't really identify with the Byzantines, is they kind of see themselves as kind of the, the superior warriors, let's say, you know, who have proper warrior values, who are either serving the Byzantines in the Varangian Guard and kind of be representing their best warriors, right? Um, or it's bands like for example, there's a band in Italy called Exultet that has songs where they praise the Italians, the Genoese, that who were, you know, in charge of the defense of Constantinople. Oh, of all the people. <laughs> right. And it's just like, you know, the the the, the great Italian valor, right, oh. it's, uh, you know, was was defending the city here. Um, well, 
Yeah, another thing that Vikings would find in Constantinople is flamethrowers pointed right at them. Yes, there are songs about Greek fire, of course. Yeah. Right. That's, you know, any kind that, of badass stuff like that. And then there's some songs, you know, since I mentioned there's a lot of um, reception of the Crusades, you know, so there's a number of songs that in narrating the Crusades, they're inevitably, especially the first crusade, they're going to involve Constantinople. Um, so... For instance, um, there's a song by the Gates of Slumber, an American doom metal band that talk about the Children's Crusade and how it was betrayed, right, by Emperor Alexius, even mm -hmm. though, like, if you look at Anna Comina and other sources, you know, he tried to help them, but they were pillaging the countryside. And so he got them over the Bosphorus, told them to wait for the actual crusaders to show up before they attack the Turks. And but they didn't listen and then they got massacred. Um, and then there's other song, there's other uh, bands that talk about how, you know, the crusaders go come to come to Constantinople and Alexius, you know, dazzles them with his wealth and luxury and all this sort of Orientalist tropes, right? Uh, and makes them swear, you know, the oath, right, to, you know, give give back, you know, our, our Roman lands uh, that you reconquer, right, and then ultimately betraying them, right, uh, by taking, they cut in a deal with the Turks to take, to take Nicaea, and so are this sort of, I think in some of these bands, you see a continuity of, you know, not even Byzantine stereotypes, but just long-term Greek stereotypes, right? Greeks as being mm. deceitful and uh, effete and, uh, you know, almost like an orientalized other, right? Oh, yeah. Um, versus these Western, you know, uh, you know, people who are manly, manly true warriors who yeah. uh, have loyalty and discipline, right? Um, but of course, they're also crusaders, so they're doing a lot of nasty things. And it's not that a lot of so yeah. metal bit songs about the crusades are necessarily glorifying the crusades as much as saying they were doing something totally misguided uh, in the name of religion. Mm -hmm. um, and these were they were doing terrible things. But, you know, they also, you know, these were people who, you know, fought for what they believed and they they were exemplary warriors. Um, so there's that sort of tension of yes um you know right. there's uh chivalry and all of this sort of warrior kind of charisma but on the other hand the way that they they fought uh you know is sort of showing well this is what happens when you direct these sort of people and impulses for bad ends we should be fighting for better causes than this yeah so these bands sound like kind of enlightenment critique in, mm -hmm. in a way but you've also written about the dark side that heavy metal can take, uh, especially mm -hmm. sort of fascist, racist bands and all of that. Uh, and, and I think it's important that we address this it, mm -hmm. also, you know, um, at the end here. So can you say a little bit about where they're coming from and, you know, how, if at all, do they intersect with Byzantium or Roman history? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, going back to kind of the early 90s, you know, we you know, see bands, you know, continuing to go to further and further extremes um, in their aesthetic, in their sound, and also in their ideas. And that can also mean politics. So as I mentioned, heavy metal abhors kind of the center, the moderate, right? Um, so if you truly embrace kind of heavy, the heavy metal aesthetic, that means you're going to go in one of two directions. You're going to go to extremes of the left or extremes of the right. A, um, and so I think this day and age, the majority go to the left, right? And I think traditionally heavy metal has been to the left with say, you know, thrash metal, for instance, being very much uh, anti, you know, nuclear war, you know, anti Reagan administration kind of, you mm -hmm. know, uh, yeah, 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 uh, types of things. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there, it does make sense that bands you know certain people would see the metal aesthetic as also compatible with you know kind of right-wing ideas you know kind of the rhetoric of masculinity and power and individualism uh as well as nostalgia for the past right 
kind of concert this kind of conservatism that is very much anti-modern, right? Um, you right. see that kind of rhetoric in 20th century fascist movements, for instance. Yeah. And so that was brought in, that was incorporated by certain heavy metal bands, largely in the underground, um, who would, um, you know, voice these ideas, partly because they knew these ideas were transgressive, right? That this was socially unacceptable, right? And that they felt sort of this power of kind of wielding this rhetoric and so that was part of it but it's been clearly demonstrated that you know these a lot of these bands were also you know taking it seriously and were participating in you know these these ideological movements right uh, so for instance uh you know one of the most notorious figures is varg vikernes from who was part of the second wave black metal movement in norway right he burned down churches but he also became very much a neo-Nazi Odinist right-wing ideologue who continues uh, to operate that way, writing, you know, uh, literature and networking with right-wing movements, even in, in, in North America. Okay, so this um, leads to a lot of bands who are of that persuasion to look at European pre-modernity as a model of what kind of society we need to bring back. Right. Um, so they want to bring back, you know, Spartan eugenics. Right. They want to bring back kind of Roman totalitarianism. They want Fascism, to bring back medieval yeah. chivalry. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're especially kind of, you know, in certain places, you know, they look at kind of the knights of Europe, you know, as a symbol against, say, you know, uh, Muslim you know, Im uh, immigrants and refugees, right? You know, taking over, you know, right. it's that kind of that kind of awful rhetoric. Um, and so, when these types of bands get interested in Byzantine history, uh, they are going to fixate, especially on, say, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Right. Uh, that is one of the most popular topics in metal that has to do with anything to do with the Byzantine Empire. And it's not just the right wing bands that are uh, talking about this event. Um, they see the last the last stand of the uh, of the Byzantines and their, you know, Italian allies uh, as a last stand that is very much like the last stand of the, of the Spartans at Thermopylae, which happens to be the most popular battle in the reception of antiquity by metal um so sense. we see in a lot of these narratives uh that of the fall of constantinople you know this kind of anti-muslim rhetoric uh that uh, for instance right this is sort of yeah. this is the end of the um, this is the end of the roman empire this is the end of civilization right uh, the forces of darkness are taking over right mm. um yeah yeah however so, yeah that I, I, however, I think what is worth mentioning is, you know, those narratives are becoming more nuanced. So I think it's worth ending on a positive note here because one of the most recent uh, releases uh, having to do with Byzantium and heavy metal is by a Canadian band from Quebec called Iternum. And they put out last year in September uh, a, a concept album called Heir to the Rising Sun. And if you look at the cover artwork, it is a painting, a modern painting of the walls of Constantinople crumbling. And from the perspective of somebody working the, the cannons in the Ottoman army, and you see the Ottomans charging into the breach with their swords drawn. Uh, and if you look at the various, at the track lists and the lyrics of that album, it is essentially, it's a concept album about Constantinople from multiple different perspectives. From the perspective, not just of the Byzantines themselves, there's even a song about the Empress Irene. Uh, there's also songs from the perspectives of the Vikings, the Varangians, and also from the perspective of Mehmet II, right? And mm -hmm. kind of how he viewed his you know, all of this as sort of a dream, right, that he had of of becoming the one to become that heir to the rising sun, right, is the is the theme of the album. Right. Um, and that, 
the last song of the album is called The Fall of Constantinople, and that's from the perspective of Constantine XI, uh, which is very interesting. He has these, there's actually a lyric video for that song you can watch on YouTube, uh, where he kind of sees himself almost as a Christ figure. He says, uh, why have you forsaken me, Theotokos, right? Uh, you know, the, right. the, you know, the Theotokos, Mary had been the defender of the city right. for so long. How, why is she failing us now? But anyway, hmm. uh, that album clearly shows that, you know, just because you are interested in this stuff doesn't mean you can't kind of approach it from different perspectives and make a good metal song out of it. So one of the members of the band, the front man, vocalist, guitarist uh, is from Morocco for instance. So that might explain why they're bringing in, you know, some right. of the Ottoman perspective as well. Right. Um, huh. So I think that's just um, a sign of, uh, of progress here um, that, uh, and I think just a token that, uh, you know, I think what used to be a very obscure interest among, you know, metal bands where you really had to be kind of a history nerd and kind of look really closely into the sources to, to, to find, to find uh, something to, to write metal on. I think it's becoming as the Byzantine empire, I think itself is becoming more and more um, known about right in the, in the popular eye. I think more bands are going to kind of see this era of history, this long rich period as something fertile and full of great stories uh that are worth setting to music well that's a great place on which to end and and i hope that this story has a future maybe we can talk about it again in a few years you can give us an update mm -hmm. um thank you jeremy for coming on uh to the podcast i want to thank you for writing all of these articles that you did i'm going to link them in the uh in the uh description of the episode or or give the references so that people can follow up on that because a few years ago i could find nothing Thank you again for you know inviting me on. This was a, a wonderful conversation. And uh, yeah, I love talking about this stuff. It's sort of how my two worlds come together. Yes. Right? You know, everything becomes work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, ultimately, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jeremy. Take care. You too, man.